What takes about 50 months and is red, black, and white all over? A revolution? That's about the amount of time that elapsed between the fall of 2016 and January 2021, this month, and the coalescence of a new national mythology which seems to be happening about now. These are rapid movements. In the second installment of The Woke Danger, I want to give you the information you need for a quick crash course in applied postmodernism. We're going to just look at four videos. I'll give you the links. You really should watch them all, but we'll summarize them a little bit. These will get you right up to speed about what's going on. We are in a new place. We can know where we are and how we got here, and we need to. Events at Evergreen College in Olympia, Washington, uh, provide on a small scale a microcosm, a test tube case of what seems to be presently happening on the vast national scale. So we're going to start with that. It seems that a new national understanding is being crafted to replace the one that we grew up with. And this is going to have enormous implications for us, for all that we do, and for me as a, as a Christian, for, our, for the things in the church. Authors James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose have written this book, Cynical Theories, 2020 is the year it was published. This book goes through and shows how we went from just postmodernism to what we might call applied postmodernism. Brett Weinstein went through the events we're going to talk about now at Evergreen College, and that's really our test tube case. He went through this in 2016. Weinstein was professor of biology. Evergreen College was founded in the 1960s, and it was the most left, uh, liberal left of left colleges uh, that there is. And when the woke thing hit there, it replicated itself very quickly. And we're going to see in a test tube case here what is now happening on the national scale. Evergreen had a tradition called the Day of Absence. And on that day, the students tended to stay away and do this and that. Well, in 2016, for the Day of Absence, they decided that no white people would be allowed on campus. Brett Weinstein refused to absent himself on the basis of his color. And on the internal email list, he wrote this. There is a huge difference between a group or coalition deciding to voluntarily absent themselves from a shared space in order to highlight their vital and underappreciated roles and a group encouraging another group to go away. The first is a forceful call to consciousness, which is, of course, crippling to the logic of oppression. The second is a show of force and an act of oppression in and of itself. The situation at Evergreen degenerated into campus riots, uh, faculty imprisoned in the library, uh, calls for Weinstein to be fired, and the administration of the college trying to get rid of Weinstein and his wife, another professor there, Heather Haying. Talk about deplatforming and depersoning. This is the test book case. I very strongly recommend that you watch the three videos. They're only about a half hour long each. There's no way to get a quicker viewpoint, a uh, real thing. You can even see the ladies uh, comfort, comfort chihuahua in the thing. Watching these three videos will give you, get you right up to speed in terms of seeing in real life what happens when this, this thing is applied to institutions, in this case, the Evergreen College. Watch Mike Nana's three-part documentary. The links are, are going to be presented at the end of this video and they're in the notes at the bottom. Weinstein gives the following from his experience. He says that Evergreen's woke infection is about a breakdown in the basic logic of civilization, and it's spreading. And college campuses may be the first dramatic battle, but of course this is going to find its way into the courts. It's already found its way into the tech sector. Um, it's going to find its way to the highest levels of governance if we're not careful, and it actually does jeopardize the ability of civilization to continue to function. And he seems to be right. Look at what some others are saying. Sasha Johnson is calling for the invention of a race offenders registry. You know, like we have a sex offenders registry. Uh, she says that people would be registered for all their microaggressions, which are things that happen in the eyes of the perceiver, not necessarily the one who's, I guess, committing them, if there is such a thing. Her December 31 Twitter post was deleted, but you can see here another article she wrote. She doesn't even want to allow race offenders, as she calls them, to live in certain areas. Now, she's, she's over on the other side of the pond here from us. This is across Western Civ. And I want to share this slide again from uh, the book Cynical Theories uh, that shows where all this lands. We're coming back to this in a future episode. So watch the Evergreen series. It's just about an hour and a half. It's essential 
to understand what's going on. But let's now turn to the last half of our presentation here today. I want to turn to something that James Lindsay, one of the co-authors of Cynical Theory, says in a podcast he just put up on January 13. The title of his podcast is called The Birth of a New American Mythology, and we're going to quote extensively from it. Lindsay comments on what's happened in just the past few days. Now, I'm preparing this on January 15, so that'll give you some context. There are two American stories, and we have to be able to tell the true American story, which in some sense you could say it starts with the colonies, but in some sense really starts with the the opening section, opening paragraph of the Declaration of Independence from July of 1776. And that sort of sets a national mythology, and it set in motion a chain of events that led to eventually the abolition of slavery, eventually the Civil Rights Acts, and the uh, end of segregation, and the end of Jim Crow, and the almost the end of racism. And I was comparing in the essay against the critical race theory uh, narrative about America, which posits instead that America was created in uh, as a slaveocracy in 1619, and that slavery and its maintenance were the, was the main reason for this, uh, the, the Revolutionary War in the 1770s. And the, this presents two very different visions. And the critical race theory story of America is one of racism and then more racism and then more racism. And in fact, the, the story in critical race theory begins from the first assumption that it has, which is that racism is the ordinary state of affairs in society, not an aberration from them. And then the second assumption of critical race theory is that uh, it's called interest convergence. It's that uh, white people specifically only help minority races, but especially black people, when it's in their own self-interest to do so. And therefore, racism doesn't actually go away. It just reinvents itself in a more hidden and insidious form. And in particular, that there is uh, built into this set of assumptions is this idea that the people who benefit from racism have absolutely no motivation whatsoever to try to get rid of it. So there are two stories. The true one, that America, as it's founded by imperfect humans, uh, imperfect though it is, has really done remarkably well over a period of time in coming closer and closer to its founding ideals. For example, racism was very dramatically reduced. But in wokeness, there's this epic convergence of bad ideas called the Dai religion. It's a secular religion, diversity, inclusivity, and equity which we'll be talking more about. Equal opportunity is being replaced by equity. And now we're going to bias, partiality, and those things. It's, it's a reversal of the progress that's been made. The power of the state and corporations united is, is really beginning to tilt the playing field so that we're losing our way. And the last needed piece in this change of our self-understanding, America's self-understanding as a nation, is, seems to be presently falling into place with the birth of new national mythology. Listen again to Lindsay. I think, he's, I think he's got something here. What we have been witnessing over the last several years from the left, and maybe the last several goes back to the 60s, but certainly over the last four or five since Trump rose on the scene and critical race theory in his shadow mainstreamed big time, is the creation of a new national mythology, what the postmodernists would call a American meta-narrative. And we've asserted, Helen and I wrote in Cynical Theories, that the woke have their own meta-narrative or set of meta-narratives. I've argued in a recent essay on New Discourses that they can constitute a, the description of a pseudo-reality. They are a, a, a national mythology. Uh, that is attempting to replace the former national mythology, which it has systematically torn down. Postmodernism, as a, as, as John Francois Leotard put it in the postmodern condition in 1979, is an incredulity toward meta narratives. And so, this kind of critical approach that targeted Western democracies, a critical theory approach, which I've talked about a bunch of times, and I may bring up some more here. And then this postmodern incredulity toward meta narratives have torn down the old story by which Americans knew who they were. And if that were all that happened or, or to have happened, that would be one thing. I'm not saying that's a good thing, but that would be one thing. But what's actually going on now is they're replacing it with a second 
mythology, their own mythology. They have been, we are witnessing, and especially have been witnessing very clearly over the last five years, the attempted creation and mainstreaming of a new American, and really throughout the West, but American national mythology that says that America was founded in slavery in 1619. There's your 1619 project. It was not founded in freedom, or with the seeds of freedom at least, in 1776 under the uh, words of Thomas Jefferson that, that uh, all men are created equal. We are witnessing the creation of a new mythology that says that America was founded in slavery, in racism, in hate, in 1619, 401 years ago, and that this is just continued throughout history. It has not diminished. It has only changed shapes. And in fact, by changing shapes, it had hidden itself and become more and more insidious. What happened at the Capitol on January 6th of this year, while the Congress met to authenticate the Electoral College vote and the election, therefore, and as everybody saw, protesters then clearly uh, unlawful rioters started to break into the Capitol, eventually did break into the Capitol, did violence. A woman was shot by police. A police officer appears to have been beaten to death. At least one other person died of a heart attack due to the whatever was going on. In all, I think five people died on the scene. Another man has since killed himself. I believe that was a police officer that did that. So whether how you want to count them, five or six deaths occurred, none of this can really be condoned at all. We, Everybody, of course, should be held to account under the law, but this isn't what we're seeing. The word accountability is being really pushed. In fact, it's going way beyond that. And what I want to assert is that this new national mythology that they're trying to foist upon us that begins with America was created in slavery in 1619 has a pivotal moment in which it will actually be mainlined and installed. A pivotal moment in its in its national mythology will be that there was a attempted, maybe Nazi, maybe white supremacist, something of this kind, insurrection and coup that it was attempted to stop the democratic election in the United States, which has a kernel of truth to it, but is mostly hyperbolic nonsense, and that the forces of good, the true America, was able to defeat those Nazis and white supremacists through what we're going to now observe is a very large amount of uh, histrionic media behavior and extraordinarily tyrannical legislation and um, actually corporate, uh, I don't even know what to call it, corporate policy. They're just banning people from social media. Anybody who has, is too close to Trump or too far off the, the proper narrative, people are referring to it as the great purge already. The new narrative will pivot upon this act on the 6th of January this year and will assert that a new era in America has arisen in which 401 years of oppression are being put behind us as we turn to a new way of thinking, a new way of life, when finally those oppressive supremacists of whatever type were all defeated in the wake of their attempted insurrection to steal an election that they believed they were stealing back or preventing from being stolen or something. So this is what we're watching. We're watching the creation and installation of a new national mythology. You have to understand how significant that is and that a very large number of people already believe this mythology very deeply. That's going to be a pivotal moment that's going to try to really mainline that and make this the, the totally hegemonic new view of what America is, was, and will be. In short, what happened at Evergreen College in 2016 and 2017 is happening now in America on a national scale. This is going to have dramatic implications for us in a thousand ways, not the least of which is the relation of church and state under a government that has gone woke. I mean, listen to Robin DiAngelo in her book White Fragility, uh, what she says about white supremacy in the church.
Here's what she writes. Racism is a structure, not an event. She goes on to say, while racism in other cultures exists based on different ideas of which racial group is superior to another, the United States is a global power, and through movies and mass media, corporate culture, advertising, U.S.-owned manufacturing, military presence, historical colonial relations, missionary work, and other means, white supremacy is circulated globally. Really? So right, all the work that the churches are doing to take Christianity across to the world and the vast missionary movement that's happened these last 150 years and a little bit longer, that's white supremacy, is it? Well, I wonder how that's going to play with a woke government. Hundreds of years of mostly positive church-state relations can immediately be changed and become very negative relations. God forbid. Well, maybe you think that people won't so readily change their self-understanding, their viewpoint of the story. They say, well, this isn't proven too well. Well, think again. Remember, in postmodern thought, you don't have truth. You just have stories, just competing stories. No story is particularly more truthful than another story. And so the stories compete, and stories are about power relations. And so the thing is not, it's, it's not about truth. The thing is not about facts. The thing is about having one story become superior over another story. And if you talk about it long enough, guess what happens? People have very short attention spans today. The question is no longer which story is true. The question is which story is the most effective in promoting the desired viewpoint about what's true. Now, for you and me, that's not the case. We want to follow the truth. But, you know, we are very easily manipulated. You could think one thing today, and then 30 days from now, you could be so full of the mass media in government presentations, you might think a totally different thing. Really. Stories aren't about truth anymore. Stories are tools to be used to promote your power the way you want the power to line up. Here's a lesson. Christians like myself, we tend to prefer to believe the best of others. And that's, that's good. It's good to have good motives like that. But you know, the Bible says something else as well. The Bible says, the simple believes every word, but the prudent considers well his steps. Proverbs 14, verse 15. It's time for a lot more prudence than we've been exercising. In our next installment, The Woke Danger 3, we're going to look at what we call the collectivist roots. We're going to go back now and go into more detail, but the purpose of today's presentation is to really get you set up. Watch the uh, four videos, the three on Evergreen College, and this presentation in New Discourses by James Lindsay. It's, it's an hour and 12 minutes, the last one, but it will put you right up to speed. It's way better than just the parts I have shared with you. God be with you in these dangerous times.